We begin this morning with that terrible accident at Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. It remains in the Patapsco River, but crews have taken the first step of cutting into the twisted steel and stabilizing the wreckage so drivers can find the four remaining workers presumed dead. The Coast Guard says its priority now is to create a smaller channel so at least some ships can pass through and access the port, which remains closed. For the latest, we're joined by the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Mr. Secretary, happy Easter. Thank you for spending part of it with us. And good morning. Happy Easter. Good to be with you. Part of the reason we wanted to chat with you is because, you know, we have this incident in Baltimore. We've seen parts of planes falling out of the sky. You've described the fact that it's a national crisis, that more than 40,000 people are killed in car accidents each year. We're going to work our way through some of this, but let's begin in Baltimore. How long is it going to take to remove that ship, clear out the debris, and reopen the channel? We haven't received a timeline yet, but what I can tell you is the work is now underway. Parts of the non-federal channel are already being uh, worked on, and there is a thousand ton capacity lift crane on a barge uh, being uh, put into place now. There's another 600 ton crane on its way to back it up. This is going to be a very complex process. There are even now forces acting on that steel, so it takes a lot to make sure that it can be dismantled safely, to make sure that the vessel stays where it is supposed to be and doesn't swing out into the channel, but it has to be done because that is the only way to get into most of the port of Baltimore. And of course, it's important not just to the people and the workers of Baltimore, but to our national supply chains to get that port back up and running as quickly as possible. Then you have the process of getting the bridge back up. That's going to take longer, but that work is already getting underway as well. And is there any sense of how long it would take to rebuild that bridge? We haven't received estimates on that yet either. I can tell you the original bridge took about five years to build, but that doesn't necessarily inform us about the timeline uh, on the reconstruction. A lot goes into how that reconstruction will be designed, how the process is going to work. Right now, we don't fully know everything we need to know about the condition of the portions of the bridge that did not collapse. Uh, obviously, that work is underway right now. To that point about funding, uh, we've heard that it sounds like most of this is going to be paid for by the federal government, either about 90 percent, 80 percent, depending on how it works, the rest by the state. Where's that money going to come from? So we're using an authority called the Emergency Relief. This is through our Federal Highway Administration. That's how we got those first 60 million out, and there will be more where that came from. Now, it is possible we may need to turn to Congress to uh, supplement that fund. That has happened in the past. If you remember the 2007 bridge collapse in Minnesota, ultimately about $260 million uh, put together, uh, including funds that were uh, put through Congress on a bipartisan basis. And I hope and expect this, too, will be a bipartisan process. So what exactly would be the pitch to any skeptical lawmaker who says, why on earth should we have to pay for this? Well, the pitch is your district could be next. And also, this has historically been bipartisan. And I'm not just reaching back to uh, bygone eras. Remember, the infrastructure package itself, President Biden's infrastructure plan, uh, went through on a bipartisan basis. A lot of people didn't think that was possible when we got here in 2021, but the president never gave up on the idea. And sure enough, a lot of Republicans were willing to cross the aisle, work with President Biden, work with Democrats to get this done. On another matter, this past week, Boeing announced some big changes in its leadership. Uh, the CEO, the board chairman, the head of the commercial airplanes unit are all leaving by the end of the year. Are those changes enough to satisfy concerns about the company? Well, one personnel change or several personnel changes are not the same thing as what we most need to see, which is a change in culture. Whoever takes these new leadership positions and everybody else uh, at Boeing, uh, especially those senior leaders who are accountable for the, the planes that, that Boeing produces and the, the work that that company does, they need to demonstrate that they put safety first. FAA has been putting Boeing under a microscope ever since this incident happened in January. And frankly, there were a lot of concerns about uh, what the FAA administrator saw uh, in the course of those visits and, and the audit. He gave Boeing about 90 days to come up with a comprehensive plan uh, to show that they're on the, the path to deliver the right kind of quality and safety. Uh, we're about 30 days into that. There are regular check-ins. And FAA is not going to allow Boeing to increase their production until they demonstrate that they can do it safely. You know, Thursday was the busiest day of the year so far, at least in terms of TSA screenings, because we're seeing an uptick now ahead of spring break or in the midst of spring break for a lot of people. But given these aviation incidents, the, the blown off door, 
on the Alaska Airlines plane, the, the panel that fell off a Delta flight recently. What would you say to those who are scared to fly right now? Well, I, I would say that every time I step onto an airliner, uh, whether I'm uh, going to look at a bridge or whether I'm uh, uh, flying somewhere with my husband and kids, uh, like we will be later this week, I know that I'm participating in the safest form of travel in America and that what makes it the safety, safest form of travel in America is all of the work and all of the people who stand behind that, including uh, the men and women of our FAA. Uh, we're talking about an extraordinary safety record. Uh, and, and just think about this mode of travel. It involves being propelled by flammable liquids in a metal tube through the sky at nearly the speed of sound and, again, is the safest way to travel. That is because of extremely rigorous standards and processes for inspection. And that's why so far, uh, since this administration arrived, there have been about three billion passengers getting onto airplanes in the United States uh, and 100% uh, of them uh, getting to where they need to go. I know when a lot of people see you on television these days, they, they may still think to themselves, oh, I wonder if he still wants the big job one day. Now that you've been closer to it, working alongside a president, is it still something you aspire to? Well, I certainly have a new perspective on just how demanding that job is, watching President Biden uh, deal with so many concerns, challenges, and, and opportunities for this country. And I'm, I'm proud to be a small part of, of the big team that helps him get that done. I sincerely don't know uh, what, uh, uh, whether I will run for elected office of any kind again. What I do know uh, is that I've been asked to take on a big job. I'm, I'm honored and humbled to do it. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's rewarding. And it's taken about 110 percent of what I have to give right now. All right. Well, we're honored and humbled you spent part of your Easter with us. Uh, our best to Chaston and the kids, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks very much. Good being with you.